Welcome back again. Welcome to another exciting episode of Calling the Divine TV. My name is Yujiro Seki. I'm a director, writer, and the producer of the documentary Calling the Divine. Calling the Divine is about the Buddhist sculptors of Japan, and I'm ready to present it for the first time in the world. But before I do so, I thought it would be a great idea to introduce basic concept of Buddhism and the history of Buddhism, so that when you guys finally watch my documentary, you guys can watch it at the maximum value. Yes, today we're going to be having super special episode. We're going to be talking about the shodo, simply translated as a Japanese choreography. But what is a shodo? And what's the relationship between shodo and Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism? So, you know, I invited somebody who's actually uh, from the United States. But, you know, he's more Japanese than I am. <laughs> <laughs> he is actually more Japanese than uh, m most of the people that I met in my life. Actually, <laughs> I haven't met anybody who's Japanese than he is. <laughs> I spent a lot of years at it, Yujiro. Thank you. I would love to introduce to you Master William Reed. Welcome to our show. Thank you so much, Yujiro. It's such an honor to be on, uh, on the programs that are previewing your uh, documentary, Carving the Divine. I'm really looking forward to that as well. Oh, thank you very much for a uh, kind word. But, you know, seriously, you're a legend. And I don't understand if there's anybody who doesn't know about you. But just for in case people who, doesn't know it, uh, people who don't know anything about you, uh, please introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, if I had to introduce myself in two words, uh, I call myself a Renaissance samurai. And let me explain that. The, the word Renaissance uh, usually refers to, uh, we think of Italy, the Italian Renaissance. And what they did was they looked at ancient Greece and ancient Rome to find ideas and inspiration from uh, mythology and from architecture and from sculpture which then inspired uh, the likes of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo to create a whole new interpretation that was quite relevant and, uh, for the times. So in Japanese, you have a, 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 an expression called onko chishin, furuki o tazunete, atarashiki o shiru, which means learn something new from the old. So that's the whole idea of the Renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth. But I'm not looking at ancient Greece and Rome. The other half of the, the name that I gave myself is samurai. So I look at samurai culture, and not only samurai culture, but Japanese culture sort of centered around the samurai and the samurai arts and Zen. And I try to draw inspiration from that and present it or represent it in a modern context that can be not only inspiring and interesting, but also very practical. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your life story. No, you have okay, a story yeah. to tell, but in a okay. nutshell, yes. In a nutshell, okay. Well, <laughs> it's a big nutshell, right? So, yeah, well, I, I first discovered Japan when I was 11 years old uh, and uh, walking home from school, these uh, older boys came along and bullied me and my friend, and that really scared us, but uh, it actually led me to discover Aikido, and I got inspired to study that, and I then ended up coming to Japan when I was 20, actually turned 20 in Japan, and that's when I began studying Aikido and calligraphy. And that was, believe it or not, Yujiro, 48 years ago. Wow. So uh, I came to Japan at the age of 20. Uh, I, of course, I went back because I was a student, but then I returned to Japan, and I've spent most of my adult life here, and uh, this year I just turned 68. So that's nearly half a century of studying um, Aikido and, uh, and calligraphy. Mm. and Japanese language and culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Now we get to ask this important question. So, uh, yes, before asking you this question, I have a little anecdote to tell too. Uh, mm. When I was a little, like an elementary school, I had a class called Shuji. Uh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yes, yes, it was not really my favorite subject, but you know, we had to do it. But, yeah. you know, uh, when I became an adult and everything, and uh, I was being a filmmaker, and uh, I was interviewing uh, this uh, shoro master, and oh. I told him, uh, you have such a wonderful uh, shuji. And he was uh, like, uh, 
What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, he wouldn't like that. <laughs> what did you say? And he was yeah. upset. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I was wondering why was he upset? And also, you. what the difference between Shuji and the Shoto? Yes, okay, that's a great question. And it's interesting that you say it wasn't your favorite subject. I think that's true for most people. Uh, they end up not really enjoying it. Uh, and, and well, okay, what is Shuji, right? It's a school subject that you study in elementary school generally, and sometimes they carry it on a little bit into junior high school. But um, it's basically using a brush to paint letters. It's kind of like penmanship, except with a brush. And uh, it's a school subject taught by the uh, homeroom teacher, who is not a calligrapher, not a specialist in calligraphy at all. And uh, the emphasis on, is on how to make pr pretty legible uh, copies of the uh, what they call the tehon or the 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 master copy. But even those uh, are not really uh, nice works of art. They're just kind of clean and easy to read. Now that's shuji right it has a beginning and an end and it usually leaves a bad aftertaste for some reason people don't like it right <laughs> and 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 so but so shodo literally means the way of the brush do is michi or way and sho is a uh, well writing or brush so the way of writing with the brush it's a lifetime training and there's no graduation so that's one difference so one is just a school subject that has a beginning and end and uh, and the other is uh, a lifetime, lifetime discipline with spiritual dimensions, okay? Then another thing about Shuji is it's one dimensional because all it works on is legibility. Can it be readable and looks reasonably balanced, right? And, but in Shoto, there are many dimensions. You have the calligraphic style. You have maybe at least five different ways of, of scripts of writing from the sort of block style to the semi-cursive to fully cursive to the uh, original ideographs that are almost more like pictures and then uh, the ratio which is kind of a wave like so there, there are these common uh, called shotai in Japanese or um, calligraphic scripts and then you have space dynamics which is the way in which the character the strokes interact with each other to create a, a feeling of tension uh, within the frame uh, or tension and energy uh so that the character looks alive and it has asymmetrical balance and there's there's space dynamics inside as well as outside and above and below the, in the whole thing okay so you don't have that in shuji and also the the way in which the lines are written uh we call it the kimyaku or the energy line and uh that is very important because you might think of that as like whether the stroke whether the character is alive or or, or limp or weak or, or even dead. And in fact, um, top level calligraphers can read what they call the shisen or the, de the death line in someone's handwriting, which is, uh, I think what happens is the brain somehow, uh, it's not like really a stroke, I mean, a, like a brain stroke, but somehow in the calligraphy stroke, the, the lack of uh, strength or the, 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 the vibration, uh, or sorry, the wavering comes out and you can, if you're trained in your eye, you can kind of see that. And it's, it's pretty scary, you know, because you can kind of see this person's headed for a fall or for a disease or even worse. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have also, you have the line quality, which you might think of like the, the tone of a musical instrument. And you have something called the four treasures of Shodo, which is uh, the uh, brush, the paper, the ink stick, and the ink stone on which you grind the ink. So there's the bumbo shiho, the four treasures of Shodo. And you don't have any of those in Shuji. Okay, um, here's another difference. Shuji is close to printing. It's like making ciphers or symbols. So it's, it's close to what, uh, katsuji, like, um, like printed characters. And so it looks even and pretty and legible, but it's, that's all it is, it's not artistic. Whereas brush writing is more like a musical instrument. Uh, I sometimes compare calligraphy to visual jazz because there's so many elements that calligraphy has in common with jazz. Um, a, there are two more differences I would say. One is that in Shuji, there's no, like if everybody's doing it, you can't tell, oh, this person did it. They're all supposed to look alike. So there's no uh, there's no individual character. It's just standardized, right? And of course, 
some people find it very difficult, so it just looks unbalanced or it looks sloppy or, and, but they're trying to make it standardized. Whereas in calligraphy, it always has character and spirit. And sometimes that's even referred to like, um, you've heard of the word kotodama, right? That the idea that words have spirit, that, that words have energy. And the same thing can be said for moji or, or characters, that characters have energy and the brush has energy. So there's a spiritual dimension to um, Shodo. And then the last major difference is, and this is quite interesting actually, that AI, artificial intelligence, completely surpasses anybody's ability to handwrite. You know, you, I mean, think of all, uh, you know, think of all the different AI developments now. We have, we have voice recognition. You just talk to your, your smartphone and whoa, the characters come up, you know, or you can just like swipe the, uh, uh, you, you start to type, type on the keyboard or swipe the screen and, and then all the options come up and it's just much faster and cleaner and easier to read than handwriting. So AI is gonna completely replace, in fact, they don't even teach handwriting in a lot of schools now, which is really, I think, a, a major loss. Whereas with Shodo, with calligraphy, uh, AI can never compete with it because uh, Shodo is based on human and artistic qualities and uh, machines just cannot get that. Even if they can imitate the shape of something, they don't, there's no spirit. It's a, it's a machine that's producing it. So those would be the major differences. And I, I don't know if that, uh, well, I think if you see, if you think of all those dimensions, like that Shodo is lifetime training and has all these dimensions as an art and it's like music as character and, and it's totally beyond machines. And if you think that that's what the Shodo master you were talking to is, that's his life. And you said Shuji, which is like letter practice and penmanship, of course he's gonna be upset. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. If you can explain that, definitely you're more Japanese than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they're not interchangeable. You can't use you can't use one to explain the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it was a very nice introduction to Shodo and everything. Uh, but you know, how does Shodo relate to Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism? Okay, well, let me tell you how I actually got interested in um, the whole idea of brush writing and Zen, even before I came to Japan. This was way back in the 1960s when I was in high school. And I'd, I'd kind of gotten interested in reading about Zen, but one thing kept coming up and that is these, um, like this is a book that I read a lot in high school, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. And it's about the Zen koan, which we'll talk about later, I think. But uh, there are these little uh, parables and puzzles uh, that are seemingly insolvable, you know, philosophical questions like, what's the sound of one hand clapping? There's no answer, right? <laughs> no logical answer, or what was your face before you were born? And yet the monks would spend months and years uh, in meditating on these things. And, but what really interested me was that they would come up with um, ways of expressing uh, their insights. In other words, a verbal answer would often not be accepted. You might give what is supposed to be the correct answer, but then the Zen master would throw you out of the room because you don't really have it yet. It's not, it's not evident in your face, in your eyes, in the way you sit, the way you move, and so go back to the meditation cushion. Well, I read, this is another author that I read, well, the same author of that book actually, uh, Paul Reps. Now, this guy was a very interesting individual from Hawaii who uh, I think, well, he ended up living in Hawaii, but he spent some years in Japan in the 60s and he was studying about Japanese culture and he picked up on ink painting and he would make these wonderful little sumie paintings and then just add a little English word like center, centering, you know, centering, right? And, uh, or like this, you know, there is paradise in earth, it is in us. And so there are these little ink paintings that he would make, and I thought that was so fascinating. And I started to read about that, and uh, those are called haiga in a way, which is like haiku with a painting. So picture poetry uh, would be a good thing. So I got, that was my first interest. Then as I got into Zen more, I realized that, that, that calligraphy in some form appears a lot in, in Buddhism, well, particularly in, in Zen Buddhism. Uh, one is something called bokuseki, 
In fact, my, uh, my good friend and uh, Zen master of uh, Edinji Temple, uh, Furukawa Roshi, sa said to me that uh, the Zen calligraphy is not Shodo, it's Bokuseki. So you think it's hard to explain the difference between Shuji and Shodo. Can you explain the difference between Shodo and Bokuseki? <laughs> Okay, that's a little bit, but I'm not going to give you lots of differences. But the one, uh, boku, uh, seki means traces, and boku is ink. So traces of the sumi, traces of the ink. And the idea that uh, it's not a calligrapher making a piece of art and winning awards or something like that. It's just some traces of ink that happen to go through the hand and the brush of the person who painted it, who's often a Zen master. And it's celebrated as a living presence. So they will hang it in the, uh, um, in the alcove when they do a tea ceremony or in the temple. You often find this calligraphy hanging there. And it's sometimes by a, grand, a great Zen master from the past. And uh, it's considered that the Zen master is actually physically present. So you remember I talked about Moji Tama or um, uh, yeah, the Fude Tama, the, the, the spirit in the ink. So here it is, this, this calligraphy, but it's considered to be that physically present, the, the spirit of the person is right there. So you have these Bokuseki ink tracks, that's one thing. Also, uh, tea ceremony scrolls always use calligraphy. And in fact, uh, my good friend, uh, Maishima uh, uh, Kotaro, who's a tea master, he said that the one thing that you always have in the tea ceremony that is not a tea ceremony implement is the kakemono or the hanging scroll. It's always a piece of calligraphy or a painting, and it's considered the most important thing, not the, not the tea bowl, but the message because it embodies the, the master who painted it. And it also sets the stage for a theme, a philosophical theme about life or of the day's tea ceremony. And then you also have this thing called the Enso. You know, uh, you know what the Enso is? You take a, a, a brush and you make a circle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's usually an incomplete circle. It just kind of ends up here. And it has a really nice, it's not exactly a perfect circle. It's a little bit oblong or like a, a oval, but it has a really f strong feeling of power. And uh, you might think of like as a halo or enko of a, in Christian um, theology, the, the saints would have a halo, except there's no face there. It's just this image of maybe uh, the universe is this big circle, uh, circle of life. And, uh, oh, there's, do you know about the 10 ox herding pictures? Jiugyuzu? Uh, ah, okay, you, you should know about this. Actually, it's Chinese, not Japanese, but um, that was in this book is when I discovered it, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. But the, uh, there are these 10 uh, pictures. I'll just show you what they look like. They start out with the person on the path, He's in, and there are poems that go with it. Uh, this was written in the 13th century by a Chinese, uh, uh, these look like woodblock prints, and then discovers the, foot, the footprints of the bull uh, or the ox, which is, represents the truth, and then uh, discovers the tail and, and, and starting to get, grasp it. And anyway, it goes through 10 stages, uh, kind of uh, mastering the bull, gaining control of it, and eventually leading it, the, the truth, and then uh, uh, next to being able to ride on the bull and playing the flute and taming the bull. And then each one has a poem. These are the stages of spiritual development. And then finally, even the bull disappears. And it's just this tranquil scene with the moon, which is also a circle. And then, uh, let's see, that's number seven. And then there are three more stages. One, this one is actually a circle. It's an end. So where everything disappears into emptiness. So the ego is gone. And then uh, a return to nature. This is uh, nine. And then the really interesting thing is the last one is you return to the world. So the enlightened one returns to the world and uh, to the marketplace and plays with children. So this is the 10 ox herding pictures. And so that's kind of, it's kind of calligraphy uh, that you see there. What else? Um, ah, Shakyo, painting the sutras. They will paint the, uh, can you explain, do you know what the sutra, how would you explain the sutras in English or Shakyo, can you explain that? Sutra is a, a, like a word of a Buddha from a, a long time ago. Uh, yeah. You know, you 
uh, recite the word of uh, Buddha uh, to yeah. meditate or you know uh, uh, give people teaching and something like that. Exactly. <laughs> so they're the scriptures of Buddhism, basically, mm -hmm. and they are supposedly uh, what the Buddha said. Although the Buddha never wrote anything down, so he had uh, I believe five hundred disciples. And they had to agree among themselves, yes, I heard him say this. Otherwise, they couldn't put it in the sutras. And you have the Heart Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, the Diamond Sutra. You have all these different uh, scripts, which have been translated, uh, presumably, originally from Sanskrit to Chinese. And then in, and it, I, it's pretty much still in Chinese. That they don't really do it in Japanese. But they've also been translated to English. But you paint these with the brush, with a small brush. As a, you can also recite them. But for calligraphy terms, you paint it with a small brush. And I'll tell you uh, one thing, I, I've done this at some temples and I'm not, I, I wasn't satisfied, as a calligrapher, I was not satisfied with the way that they did it. Because first of all, the characters are way too small to catch the details of the, uh, the nuances of the strokes. Secondly, they usually give you a fude pen, which is just a brush pen, artificial pen, not a real brush. And then sometimes they actually ask you to trace on top of it, which is not really, um, you know, reproducing it. And so when we do shakyo in calligraphy, we, we will do something where it would fit in a square, maybe this size, much bigger, each stroke. And then we would, uh, you know, go through and, and paint all of the, uh, I don't know if I have one uh, close by, but, uh, but we, we would do that. Um, as a means of, well, concentration and also developing brush technique, but um, it's not this little cramped, you know, thing where you're just tracing on top of it. But, but anyway, it is calligraphy. What else? Uh, I mean, those would be the main places where it would connect to uh, Buddhism. Oh, also sometimes the, a sutra is, uh, sorry, a calligraphy is made of a koan. Hmm. The koan, which is the, the, the thing like one hand, sound of one hand clapping, the, the, the theme for meditation or a story of a Zen parable, like a title that would remind people of the story. Like, do you know the word, uh, the one, uh, kisako? Mm. Okay, it's kis, kisa, like kisaten is like a, a tea or mm -hmm. uh, like a co coffee house, tea house. And ko means sadr or to go away. So it means go and have a cup of tea. And, uh, the story, uh, I'll just tell you briefly, uh, uh, there was a, a, a Zen priest in China named Joshu, uh, would be the Japanese reading of it, but he, uh, he was a, a venerated master and uh, a new student came and wanted to um, gain training under him. So he asked, you know, he uh, uh, approached the, the Zen, the, the master, and the master looked at him and said, have you been here before? And he said, no, this is my first time. I humbly beg, you know, to enter your, your, as, as your disciple. And so he said, uh, kisako, uh, go and have a cup of tea. That was all he said. And, uh, and then uh, his, another disciple was nearby watching this. And then a veteran disciple who was there every month all the time, he comes up and he greets the master and the master asks him the same question. He says, um, have you been here before? <laughs> He's there all the time, right? Uh, oh, yes, Master, I'm here every, I learn from you every month. You know, uh, Kisako, go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> and so then this, his um, a disciple was watching this. He asked him, Joshu, why is it that you say the same question to each person, whether new or old, and you give the same answer? So what do you think he said in answer to that question? Kisako, go and have a cup of tea. So it's again, it's a big circle. So the only that that's the answer, right? Mm. And that's the koan, and it's a very famous koan or Zen parable that you have to meditate on the meaning of. And I, I guess you could explain because uh, you know Western people like to have at least some kind of intellectual toe hold or hand hold to to kind of grasp. So what is this? It's not just running around in circles. Well, the idea was that. Before we get into any discussion, uh, let's have a cup of tea because this is such a fundamental way to engage with each other. And, and it's, it's just going back to essentials. 
So that would be kind of an intellectual answer, but that answer would not allow you to pass the koan. It would go back to the meditation cushion, cushion because it's just an intellectual explanation that probably you didn't even think of yourself. You just heard it somewhere. So you have to give an answer which is satisfying to the Zen master that, that will enable you to pass on to the next koan. And then you've got another six months of study. And it might be something like, how many stars are there in the sky? If you say an infinite number, so how do you know? Well, that's what I learned in school. You don't know, you haven't verified it. Go out and count them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, no ans there's no logical answer. But to deepen your consciousness and create this awakening, which would then be uh, evident in your face and your eyes and the way you moved, and then that would earn you the right to do another one. <laughs> you know, and eventually, eventually you, you uh, would then become a Zen master. So Kisako, so, but I actually painted this uh, at Edinji Temple. I had this, this amazing opportunity. Um, Edinji is a, uh, a, a Rinzai, Rinzai is the sect of Zen that uses koans. And um, I had the opportunity to paint this on the grounds of the uh, Edinji Temple in Yamanashi, wow. which was built in the 1500s, using a very large piece of, of handmade uh, Japanese paper and a large brush that, I was using for the first time, so I'd never actually, I couldn't practice. It was just like, just do it. And I painted Kisako with the Zen master standing right in front of me, and we actually got it on video. So would you like to see that? Wow, you are actually ahead of the game. That's what I was going <laughs> to ask you. Like, <laughs> you want to see the examples of everything you talked about. Because okay, well, yeah. That, that, about that's, that's, one thing. Yeah. yeah and there's you know, it, yeah. different things. So please, please. Okay, well, let me share my screen. Uh, uh, first of all, let me bring up, I have, we, I, this is right after I uh, painted it. Uh, and it's the picture of um, me and uh, Zen master Furukawa. And I'm holding it and you can see it's red from right to left, Kisako. Mm. So it's quite large, right? <laughs> Yes. And then he's got my signature on this. And this is actually quite a famous gate uh, in front of the temple. Hmm. Uh, Oda Nobunaga, you know, the, the, yes. the civil, civil, the Sengoku period. Uh, uh, he actually burned this temple to the ground. Hmm. And uh, there were a lot of people inside of it too. And when the Zen master at the time said, um, uh, Shinto mekkyaku hi wa mata onozu. That's what it says on the left, which means when the mind is tranquil, even the flames are cool. So he left those words and then perished in the flames. But uh, he, he had some people, you know, uh, escape with some of the temple treasures and they, they captured. And that's actually written there just right behind me. <laughs> but anyway, let me show you the video. Um, so you can kind of get a, a picture. Uh, let's make this full screen. This is about three minutes, so I, I, I won't speak during this time, but you just watch it. And then if you have any questions.
Wow. <laughs> I mean, the, the music was added later, but uh, that, you know, that was uh, Butske Hunban, just, just go for it, you know. <laughs> wow, impressive. Well, I have a suggestion for you. So maybe we can go back to the video and uh, we can play it. And the while the video is going on, maybe you can explain to us uh, what's going on and uh, what you're trying to achieve and uh, maybe the relationship ah. between Zeng and the uh, Shodo okay. and something like that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, instead of maybe playing the whole video again, I, 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 I will play a piece of it. And then, but first I'll say the kinds of things that were going through my mind. Oh, okay. And then, and then, cause otherwise it's, you know, it's at three minutes. So, okay. so, um, I've got this blank sheet of paper. It's quite expensive too. It's like 3000 yen for one sheet. So you can't really practice, you know, it's like you get one shot and it's handmade paper and a very large brush that I'd never used before. So I really don't know. Uh, I, I, of course, I had the image in my mind. I, I, I'd practiced it with a pencil so that I knew like the stroke order and what I was going to, you know, I had the I had general idea of the balance. But basically, once you're on, you're on. And uh, it's like uh, in Zen that everything is like living in the moment. And um, in calligraphy, you can't use an eraser. So once you just start, you're just in the process and then you can't say, oops, uh, oh, let me do that again. You just have to keep going with it. So the only way, because how do you know how much ink is going to be enough without running out of ink, right? And how do you know where you're going to place the first stroke so that you're going to end up with the thing nicely balanced up and down and sides? You don't know that, right? So the only thing that you have is your, uh, your own center, you know, which is what you focus in in meditation, you're finding your center. That's why I started kind of meditative posture. And then you have your engagement with the materials. So uh, the, usually when people use a large brush, people, uh, people think, oh, it's gonna be dynamic and you're gonna be like going this way and then maybe tear the paper and stuff. I don't think that's really, uh, good performance shodo. In my mind, it was almost like I was using a very small brush, a kofude, very tiny brush, because I was trying to find the, the uh, what called the kimiaku, or the, the, the lifeline that goes through the stroke. So, I, the, so how do I know when to, turn, when to stop, or when to lift, and when to turn? In other words, the rhythm. The only way I can know that other than, of course, experience, but I, had, I don't have any experience with this particular brush or paper or anything. The only way I can know that is to listen to the materials. Uh, it's a, that's kind of a Zen expression by itself, but if I listen, if I kind of listen to the paper and I feel the brush, when does it want to move? To say, no, wait, okay, it's all alive. And then turn and then lift and then, then the, all the timing of when you stop and when you pause and everything. If you are really relaxed and engaged in the process, the materials themselves will give you hints. So you might think of it like, uh, instead of being like a soloist on a stage, you're a member of an orchestra. So you're listening to the brush, you're listening to the paper, you're listening to the wind, you're listening to the, the whole atmosphere of everything. And you're one, you're a part of the orchestra and then uh, you just know the timing, but you have no idea what it's going to look like until you've done it, right? But that's so that's what was going through my mind, right? So if you want to, <laughs> I could I could go through that again. Maybe I'll just uh, like uh, again share the screen and um, yeah, anything interesting? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this without the music, right? Mm -hmm. That's good without the music. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So you ha you see here's kind of a panoramic of the uh, of the kedai or the grounds of the temple. This is actually just the outside grounds. The, the, the most of the temple is actually behind that, and then there's a, a beautiful garden. And so that first stroke, just like bringing it from the bucket to the paper, and it makes this nice trail of, uh, of uh, ink, which is. Uh, really closer to a bokuseki, you know, the ink traces. And, uh, but that was really cool. And then the feeling of just trying to keep it really, uh, feel where the center, the core of the brush 
which is underneath the, the stem of the brush, where that's in contact with the paper, you can actually feel a kind of a little bit of resistance because it's handmade paper is a bit rough. So it doesn't, it's not slippery. So if you maintain that contact, even when it's just lightly touching it, you can kind of, you can even almost hear it a little bit. So this is what I'm doing is listening to the materials. And then uh, I also tried to make it kind of ceremonial. So, you know, then I would begin and end with the bow. And then I add the, uh, the signature and the signature seals at the end. But it's, it's a quite a thrilling experience because you have no idea what's going to happen and you just have to be fully engaged in, in the moment. And plus the Zen master is watching. But the thing is, what happens most of the time when we're on, when we're on stage or somebody's watching or the camera's going, uh, most people get self-conscious. It's quite normal. Uh, I, I've done a, a whole lot of television like NHK uh, where it broadcasts uh, overseas by satellite and the audience is like 10, 100 million people. But if you think about that, you're going to be, ah, oh, you're so nervous, you know, what, how, how am I, what do I look like? What am I saying? You know, and it, it paralyzes you. But if you kind of get, uh, again, it's similar to this thing of you're a member of the orchestra. So it's not just you. There's the people who made the paper and the people who made the ink. And then there's the Zen master and the people who came to see it and the beautiful weather, it's all part of the whole experience. And um, we, we uh, captured it on film, which was really nice, but actually the experience itself is gone. And the only thing that's really left other than this image is the actual piece of calligraphy itself, which um, I donated to the temple and it's now on permanent display, which is really such an honor. Wow. Because there's, a, in that same temple they have, um, uh, works by Sen no Rikyu and uh, by Takeda Shingen and uh, Yamoka Teshu, you know, these incredibly famous tea masters and samurai. Wow. And then, they, and they also have my, my work there. So it's just like such an honor. Uh, to Can you switch, up, switch, switch back the camera real quick? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I don't know if, yeah, no. I don't know if that helped. No, that's. See. <laughs> That's incredible. So this is one of the most awesome episodes that I ever had, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, it, calligraphy has so many dimensions. I mean, we've been talking about Buddhism and, uh, and uh, koans and things like that. But you also have, um, uh, well, for example, uh, I mentioned the kofude. So this is, um, you may recognize as the iroha nihoe. Mm -hmm. Om, the, the, it's a Japanese syllabary, mm -hmm. but it's done in um, Heian style calligraphy. And so, yeah. you know, we do, it's really, really fine lines. So this is, this is part of our normal practice. And then, uh, of course, you have normal, uh, like Hanshi, where you do like a Kaisho. And then the same characters with a semi-cursive, which would be Gyosho. And then the same characters which, with, with fully cursive, which would be Sosho. And so, of course, we do all this kind of stuff. And then, oh, I've got another thing to show you here. Um, my calligraphy um, organization produced a calendar uh, for next year. And um, I had the privilege to be, uh, have my work listed in the calendar, uh, posted in the calendar. So you see there's the photo. And this says, uh, Toku ko narazu, kanarazu rin ari which means virtue is never alone. It always uh, is accompanied by, you know, people. So if you're virtuous, you will not be lonely. So oh. this is, you know, and, and so we do. You're in the middle. Well, it's just, it happened, just happened to be in the middle there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but, but I, but I was, I was lucky to get into the calendar. And so we do lots of, uh, um, we have competitions, exhibitions at the uh, gallery in Ginza several times a year, getting ready to do one in, um, in October. So it's, I already produced the work and so it'll just be displayed there. So but it's part of the, the interesting thing is that um, people say, oh, I don't really care about rank or, uh, you know, because it costs money to participate in exhibitions. You have to pay for the framing and to the, have the the evaluation fees and stuff. So some people say, oh, I'll just practice on my own. You'll save money, but you won't make any progress because you have no, no standard to compare yourself against. 
And when you're, when you know it's going to be on display or, you know, it's going to be, uh, evaluated by judges of, you know, who are really right, like high level, uh, you really concentrate and do your best. And like, I find even though you don't, you think, you know, you're not doing that much exercise. I usually go and in, break into a, a sweat when I'm painting, especially for exhibition moves. I just completely drenched in sweat. But it does. It's not. It doesn't seem like a lot of exercise. But it's the actually the really interesting thing, Yujiro, that the ancient Chinese. Um, I sometimes I read the texts and the, what the great masters would say, the calligraphy would do for you, or what it was like, what what it experienced, and they would talk about that. How you break into a sweat and you your breathing becomes long and slow, and um, and the the ancient Chinese would would pursue. Uh, uh, calligraphy as well as tea ceremony and other things as a method of gaining immortality mm. now if they really got immortality they still be alive today but but they would live long a lot a, a lot longer than the average person so it really vitalizes your your uh your organs and uh, you know uh, slows down your breathing and uh so i i, I say rather than immortality i say longevity mm. so uh, calligraphy is really good for perpetual youth and longevity that's kind of my 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 theme that i'm aiming for and i'm hoping to convey to people mm, wonderful wonderful but, you know, I'm, I'm almost 70 years old but i i don't feel that and uh i feel actually younger than when i was younger so if that mm. makes any sense <laughs> but i think you know calligraphy is one thing that has helped a lot in that mm. well i think uh, many people are also interested in your practice of martial art like a uh, budo. So yeah. how does the budo relate to whatever uh, we talk about today? <laughs> yeah, great question, great question. Well, actually, there is a, a really good connection. Um, I, I did a, a series of articles, more than a dozen, in uh, this magazine called Gekkan Hiden. Mm. And uh, for example, Sakamoto Ryoma. So I would look at his signature and analyze his, his handwriting. And then there's also a video of this on their website with me actually painting his handwriting. So that's Sakamoto Yoma, one of the famous uh, samurai in the Bakumatsu. Wow. And then, uh, oh, it's, it's, I did, you know, 12 of them. This is Oishi Kuranosuke of the 47 Ronin, the Chushingura story. Right. So by painting his, his calligraphy, uh, I, I, it's almost like you have to enter the spirit or... I don't like the word channeling, but you almost have to channel the spirit of the person that uh, you're painting. Otherwise, you can't create a likeness. Uh, Yamoka Teshu. And, you know, to, to actually try to paint the, the uh, calligraphy of these samurai masters, really, um, it's not like just trying to make a nice, beautiful painting. You're actually doing it to make, make the movements that you make have to be as close as possible in breathing and rhythm as to the person who actually painted it. So you really have to kind of leave your ego out and just enter that space. And for a period of a few minutes, you become them. So that's kind of, it's kind of like uh, acting in a way, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, you become that. And then you see behind me, there's a, uh, uh, okay. And you see there's a sword. Well, um, let's bring this up closer so you can see. Yes. Uh, this is, very famous, yes. Yeah, Makoto uh, yes. is, um, it, mean, it's, it was the uh, theme for the Shinsengumi, you know, uh, in the, the, the Shogun's um, protective core. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a samurai, it's also part of the Bushido code. And you have this, this means words or speech, and this means to become. So, but the whole character as a, as a whole means authenticity or um, integrity. So your words must match your actions. So I painted this uh, right after my Iaido master cut through uh, some very thick straw with a, a backhanded stroke. It was quite amazing. We, we have a video of that as well. But um, so, and, I, and the, the theme of my um, uh, column is the, the brush is the sword of the mind. And so here, this is my Iaido sword. So I also practice. Uh, Iaido and Aikido. Iaido is more recent, but I've been doing Aikido for 
since I came as a foreign student, so 48 years. So yeah, to me, uh, calligraphy is like, it's very, very similar to martial arts. In, in, but you say, well, how? It's not like self-defense or something. You're not like you know, defending yourself with a brush. But it's not similar in that way. It's similar in that you have to be fully concentrated and centered. And the, the energy has to be so focused that it comes out in the strength of the line and the balance of the composition. So it's a, like, the, the, and that takes me back to the, in high school when I read that the calligraphy was a picture of the mind. So you couldn't fake it. Like um, Suzuki Daisetsu, who wrote uh, Zen and Japanese culture, was a huge influence on me in high school. And I still love the book. He wrote about how Zen influenced swordsmanship and tea ceremony and uh, you know, flower arranging, so many things. Well, anything that has dough on it was influenced by Zen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's a, a really strong connection there. The spirit, I think it's the spirit and the energy and the meditative effect. Ah, that's one thing, yeah. I, a lot of people think, oh, you wanna do meditation, you have to sit calmly, right? Well, that's one kind of meditation. Uh, and it's an important one, but there, but can you meditate in movement? So moving meditation, martial arts is moving meditation. Can you maintain that centering and that calmness, even when people are attacking you or you're, you're moving vigorously? Hmm. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I'm a very speechless, but uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a final question for you. Yeah, probably the most difficult question. Uh, you might not even e even be able to answer this question. <laughs> well, let me try. <laughs> so uh, we learned today, uh, Shuji or Shodo? Yeah. <laughs> That's a question. That's the question. Well, yeah. definitely Shodo. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Great, great. <laughs> we learned yeah. from Shodo today. Wonderful. So uh, I would love to hear more about you. Uh, okay. Sure. Tell us well, uh, you know, what's going on in your world and the, you know, your website and the social media. Yeah. And all that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'd be happy to share that. Well, I'm, I, let me, if I may, just share. I'm working on a number of different projects now. So uh, just briefly, um, I'm working on creating a series of works that we're going to exhibit and actually even sell eventually. Uh, but it's a collaboration with the um, chairman of the Japan Washi Association. Washi is handmade paper. And so it's a Mr. Hino, and he, he will paint these ancient characters in the, um, uh, the ideograph, the, like, it looks like more like a picture, or a hieroglyphics. And on top of that, then I paint uh, poetry with a small brush that has the same theme. And then we'll put it in an acrylic frame and, and do it. So that's, that's one thing we're working on now. Also, I've gotten a number of commissioned calligraphy projects from Zen temples, like uh, Erinji was one, and then Asama Shrine in Kawaguchiko. They've asked me to paint their panels in their tea room. So, uh, and then uh, our, our, our Iaido Dojo in uh, Asakusa Kuramai Hogyokai Dojo, I painted their, their scroll. Um, so I've got those commissioned works. And next month, I'm starting an online Shodo class uh with a company called brainworks academy so uh i'll have a, uh actually and, if, and i'm teaching at the university and a, a friend of yours as well sean renzo head uh, the shakuhachi master uh we're going to be doing some co collaborations so with shakuhachi the bamboo flute and uh and shodo which to me are quite compatible and then uh, i'll share my uh, social media stuff in a in a uh well yeah i can just show, this and show you that now uh probably uh okay share screen yeah i have a website called uh samuraiwalk.com and actually this is the first this is the top page samurai walk and this leads to uh you know youtube channel and stuff like that and then there's uh show me shodo which is uh um just about my Shodo activities. And then uh, Samurai Shodo, this is articles and videos that I talked about on where you can go and see 
the painting of, of uh, when I painted the master, these various masters. And then also I've got a Instagram channel, which shows some of the um, stuff I've been working on. This is, this is an example of the uh, high gas. See, this, this is the moon. That's the original character for moon. And then I painted a poem on top of that. And just, you know, lots of variety. Some of it's digital. I do digital calligraphy as well. Uh, did some, this is Dioma's signature. I painted that in Aberdeen, Scotland at a, an event there. Did the poster, the calligraphy on this poster for the Aizu documentary, Aizu Kakugoju 150th anniversary. Some paintings of, you know, Sumie paintings, collaborations. Oh, I wrote a book uh, some many years ago, actually. Uh, calligraphy for the flags of Fudin Kazan for uh, 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 the karate, this was for NHK. I mean, there's just a whole lot of, a little bit of uh, Robert De Niro, <laughs> you know, sucking on not a, a, a cigar, but a, a stick of ink, mm. just having some fun. Anyway, this is my Instagram um, thing. And then I guess my dream, I don't know, uh, my dream is to help Japanese to rediscover calligraphy because a lot of them like yourself they had a kind of a bad experience with shuji <laughs> and you're not doing calligraphy and you don't really maybe know that much about it and you don't go to exhibits and you don't really it i mean you probably like music you go to see music and stuff like that but calligraphy no it's too specialized so i want to help japanese rediscover calligraphy and learn how to show and t demonstrate and tell about it show and tell in english so I think it would be really cool if Japanese could, even if they're not painting themselves, if they could show a famous work of calligraphy and why it's so cool, what it means, and, and talk about the, the importance of calligraphy in, in Japanese culture and a way of cultivating the person. If they could do that in English, they would get so much respect because it shows they have pride in their own, pride and knowledge in their own culture. Mm. And I'm teaching uh, at the International College of Liberal Arts in, um, in, in uh, Kofu, uh, a college called ICLA. I teach students from over 30 countries. And some of them are amazing. Just in like six to eight weeks, they're getting like, oh, you can't believe how good they get. Because I teach them the, the kotsu or the knack of how to actually, it's very difficult how to use the brush, how to move it without your hand shaking and all that stuff. But I teach them that. And... Uh, they make really good progress. So I'm, I'm hoping that that will encourage Japanese to say, hey, wait a minute, you're from Finland, you're from Vietnam, how come you paint so well? <laughs> no. mm. But you know the kotsu, kotsu tsukama, you know the knack, mm -hmm. and you have the interest and you practice. And so instead of surrendering everything to AI and just letting Japanese culture wither and disappear, I'm hoping the Japanese will take it up and uh, as an analog thing, a way to engage and cultivate your body, and your mind and stay young and live a long time and enjoy uh, sharing the culture with the world. So why can't Shoto become popular and cool like sushi or uh, anime? That's my question. <laughs> Good point. Good <laughs> point. Uh, wow. But, I think, but even what you're doing here, sharing this on your program and carving the divine, that's a great way to do it because you're doing it in English and you're getting the word out. And if, if people outside Japan take an interest, then people inside Japan will definitely get interested. It's the way it always goes, right? Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a funny, isn't it? So Re yeah. reverse importation. It's always been that way. <laughs> no, that that that's wonderful. You know, I really admire your uh, mission. You know, it's a uh, really really awesome. So yes. So if you think this information is useful, make sure to subscribe my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and like me on my Facebook because that's how I do it in the 21st century. So thank you very much, uh, Master Reed, for thank coming you. here and uh, <laughs> talk to us about the Shodo. Thank you, Yujiro. I enjoyed uh, speaking with you. And, and good luck on, on your um, documentary. It's going to be great. I've seen some previews. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.